wrong, little Billy? What seems to be troubling you? What you doing, Pa? Why, I'm a watching John Ford's 1940 film classic, The Grapes of Wrath. Why are you watching that, Pa? Well, because Joe Christiana seems to believe it. <laughs> well, this is an important work of cinematic art that should be discussed thoroughly, I reckon, on the Cutting Room Movie Podcast. What's a podcast, Pa? Well, it's kind of hard to say. A podcast is sort of like a radio show. A show that's on the radio, only it's on the internet instead. Does that mean we'll be uh, hearing an Ovaltine commercial soon? Oh, no, no, no. It's not that kind of radio. With, like, advertising dollars and such to spare. You see, this radio show's more free-like. Anyone can listen to it for free, if and they have a computer. Wow, I like when things are free. Well, many of us do, little Billy. I'd imagine the Jode family sure did. The Toad family, Pa? No, 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 no. No, the Jode family. The Jode family were kicked off their land during the Great Depression, and so they slowly traveled to California to get jobs as migrant workers, which also didn't pay them much of a wage. Well, if it was called the Great Depression and it was so sad, what was so great about it? That's a very good question, Billy. I can't rightly say why at this juncture. Just know that these people were very sad and with little to no money at all. And when they come across nice people that were giving things for free, it gave them a little hope, even though they were chock full of pride. Like our hero, Tom Joad, even though he was paroled for doing something very bad to someone, he still wound up being something of a hero. What was he in jail for, Pa, that he got paroled? You know what paroled means? I do, Pa. I saw something about it in a newsreel. Well, Tom Joad served time for homicide. Is that like a crime for killing queers? Oh, no, 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 no. It was a more self-defense killing. But in the movie, Tom Joad, played by Henry Fonda, who was barely in the middle part of the movie, was set free. And it all comes back around to things that are free, doesn't it, Pa? Why, yes, little Billy. Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> was the Grapes of Wrath free? Or did you have to buy a ticket to it? Oh, well, no. You see, nothing's free nowadays, little Billy. If you want to see a movie like The Grapes of Wrath, you still have to pay for it, like through a service such as Netflix. Although Netflix, of course, couldn't barely even find a copy of The Grapes of Wrath to send me to watch. And that's why your old Paul had to wait days and days and days for it. Because there are so few copies of it actually being rented that I had to be put in a holding pattern to wait for my copy to come. And now that it has come and I am finally able to watch it, I have no doubt that I will send it back to Netflix right away when I'm finished with it. I won't even ask what the special features are on the disc. Aw, oh, Jay, why is that, Pa? Is it not a good movie? Oh, no, I mean, well, it has historical significance. That sounds boring, <laughs> Pa, gee whiz. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just say the movie's from another time and place. <laughs> you saying it's an old-timey movie, Pa? <laughs> well, I did notice when Tom Joad and the not-so-preacher man were walking up to the Joad house outside, you could hear their voices sounding off in like an echoey-type fashion, as if they weren't so much outdoors as they were, well, inside a 20th Century Fox soundstage down in Culver City. I get sleepy just hearing about it, Paul! <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it's a good idea to go to bed then, little Billy. Because if you keep talking to me in that hateful, grating, annoying, old-timey way of yours, why, I'll either kill you or fall asleep myself. Aw, Jay! <laughs> nah, I'm just jesting, little Billy. You go on now. Paul's going <clears> to <throat> finish this two-hour and eight-minute movie now <laughs> about a family of ragamuffins and rustabouts <laughs> with lots of big speeches that really go nowhere. And lots, of <laughs> <laughs> lots of jibber jabber, jibbering and jabbering and... Well, it really doesn't sink its dramatic hooks into a jaded so-called cinema lover such as myself. Oh, and the shame I feel for staring at the ceiling while Grandma's stinky corpse funks up the covered wagon, just like Aunt Edna's does in National Lampoon's Vacation, <laughs> a far superior film. <laughs> pa? Yes, Billy? I found an old VHS cassette from the 80s Ma had. Something about the Jane Fonda workout. 
did you now? And whatever did you do with that tape, Billy? I played with myself to it, Pa. I couldn't help it. Those Fonders are some Hollywood family, ain't they, Pa? <laughs> yes, little Billy. Yes, they are. Uh-oh, here comes Grandpa. Hide. <laughs> I smell spare ribs. Somebody's been eating spare ribs. How come I ain't got none? <laughs> Oh my God. Is that the is that it? Is that the end? Is that the climax? <laughs> That's the climax. <laughs> uh, wow. Take that, John Steinbeck and Ford. Yeah. Henry Fonda. <laughs> and John Carradine. You fucking hacks. Losers. <laughs> Piss on their graves. Oh my God. <sighs> What do I say? Where do I go? What do I do? What's going to happen for the next 30 minutes? <laughs> we just move on to National Lampoon's Vacation. Wow. A far superior film. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, Joe, do you have any questions for the man? <laughs> That, actually, that's exactly what my review sounded like for uh, As I Lie, Lay Dying, Max. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> yeah. Except the elder man was uh, asking the child questions. <laughs> wow, really? <laughs> wow, man. That uh, I don't know, Tom. You're the leader of the I show. I know, Max. Do something. Well, listen, <laughs> do something. We're, we're, all, we're all, listen, we're all familiar with Max's... Uh, disdain towards uh classical films max it's true that you call uh turner classic movies the tcm you <laughs> call it total what is it total crap marathon oh. <laughs> is this true <laughs> <clears throat> listen here's what i think we should do okay one of these days we should seriously like take all three versions Forget a new release. Let's take all three versions, and I think there might be more, of Mutiny on the Bounty. What do you got? You got Mutiny on the Bounty. You got Mutiny on the Bounty with uh, – the first one was with Lawton, right? Then you got Lawton and Gable. Lawton and Clark Gable, yeah. Correct. Right. Then, you, then we'll do um, – Brand, We'll do Brando. Brando. Yeah. Brando. And and who was who was Bly in that one? Mel Gibson and oh I don't know. And then Mel Gibson and Hopkins in the Bounty, okay? Mm -hmm. And we we go through the story and how it's told in all these different generational times, but we each have to actually read the novel first. So we have to read the novel, and then we have to watch the three versions of the film, or the three versions cinematic versions of the novel, and then have like an epic conversation. This is what he got out of the Grapes of Wrath, Joe. Mutiny on the Bounty. I, he's, just, he's just running for the nearest other film that's not the Great <laughs> Sister <Surprise>. Well, <laughs> anything will do. Yeah. Lawrence well, fucking Arabia. Anything. Yeah. Well, I will say, Tom, can I, do you want no, I, no, are you gonna, somebody go. I'm so All right. Well, you're doctor. supposed to direct the show. Jesus. Uh, well, I will say that what you're saying there about Mutiny on the Bounty is, is applicable here. I mean, you have to look at the movies within the context of from which they are made, you know? So I don't even want to say you have to make allowances because I think that the film, I, look, man, I think the film is incredibly beautiful as Absolutely. it is. I feel, no, no, it's you're like, saying like that, that if I... But it's like I feel almost embarrassed saying that now because I think it's embarrassing. It's beautiful. But uh, also, like, I try, I know that... Well, that's um, that's to, preposterous and you know well, just it, to Well, just to explain why I picked this and why I was hoping that you would... Uh, like I wanted to share it with you, show it to you, or whatever was was basically because I know that you you don't like watching the old movies, you know. So like I picked one that I thought was like one that stood the test of time or whatever, and you know that was actually going to work that you might um, you know get something out of. But I, I you got geez, nothing, man. Joe. I, no, I, I would know. not have guessed in advance that Max would like the Graves of Wrath. It is uh, Max. I love old movies and and the Grapes of Wrath and John Ford in general. Great on my nerves sometimes, like you cannot believe. And it's that old timey shit. It's that canned, like John Ford was always too fucking cute in in certain things. Like it just he cranked it up to cartoony levels on the the kids and the old people and the 
pathos and the well, oh, gee, the comedy, gee whiz, the com- it sure is a pretty land we're looking at. And you're like, oh, for fuck's sake, you know, just sh- <laughs> you don't have to crank it up to 11 on every fucking scene, you know. Well, listen, Sorry. I know it appears like I took a giant shit on the grapes of wrath, but <laughs> yes, I really I, I didn't hate it. It just wasn't. <laughs> yeah, it would be hard to determine that from the review that you gave. It just. <laughs> it was just. It was just. I. I. I'm sure if I lived in that time, and I went out to the movies at night with my wife, and we sat in the theater, and we watched a newsreel and a short and a cartoon, and then next thing you know, I'm sure I would have had a much more profound experience. But look, look at the Greg Tolan cinematography is captivating. That first, that opening shot, that first shot, you, I'm just already like reeled in on this one. I think. Well, there's a good place yeah, to start, no. Tom. Yeah, it, the, it was, the cinematography like, uh, is a good place to start in, I hear. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, I like that scene like early in the movie, too, with the candles. Oh, it was just freaking. I, I mean, it's just, uh, it's just like something really beautiful to me. It, you know? The camera work is extraordinary, and the direction of the camera work is equally extraordinary. I was. I, I, I love this movie. I never saw it before. Oh really? And I sat oh, there good. for two so then, hours, okay. and it the two hour. I swear, and Max, I'm always with you usually on on uh, on these old films. I, I'm not into them. Joe knows this. Anything before 1960, I go into them like I'm not gonna like it. Like I just I have a sour taste in my mouth before I even start screening the film. Same thing here. Opening shot right away. I'm in. I was like, this is just fucking beautiful. This is going to be beautiful. And I was in a great mood. And Henry Fonda, who I totally adore. I, to me, this, this performance by Henry Fonda is outstanding. You know, I mean, to me, it's almost as good as his last performance, which I think is the best one that I've seen. And that's in, in on Golden Pond, another movie I love. But I, I totally got into this movie. I mean, I felt I was there and I felt for this family. You know, and I hated the government. I hated the landowners. I hated what was going on. And I felt bad that these people were, like, moving around, constantly moving around, just trying to find home, just trying to find home. And it, it eluded them. I'm in on this one, Joe. Thanks for bringing it to the table. Dude. Yeah, well, I'm glad that it, that it worked, man. Because, like, I just – honestly, we don't cover enough old movies, and I, I get so sure. – I, I bring them with such trepidation out because – you know they're open to such ridicule, I guess, because of the um, the time difference thing. You know, but I, I mean, I, I honestly think that it's a lot like a lot of things, man. Like I don't know, certain types of food, acquired taste, whatever. When you start watching movie, old movies, you start to like your you, your uh, your defenses start to wear down a little bit, and you start to accept them on their own terms a little bit. And again, it's that sure. context thing. I think that's I, what I it's so. about, and that's what I'm slowly learning about anything before 1960, which I have a hard time relating to being born in the seventies. Like, you know, I'm like, you know, it's just trying to accept them on their own terms. Like Tom, do you have trouble listening to music before, like, you know, before the seventies and sixties? Absolutely not. No, absolutely not. So is it, is it like, is it particularly film that you have trouble with? Like nothing else particularly bothers you art-wise, that's made before the 70s and 60s? I think the problem I have, and this is what I think Max really drives on, is just the camp, the campiness of the acting. Mm. You know, it's just it's just not there yet. You know, it's not until, what, who Brando comes along, where, where the scene really starts, <clears throat> the James Dean, Marlon Brando, guys like this, Paul Newman... This this is when it starts to change, right? It's true. It's true, man. But you have to again. It's a context thing, right? So if film is probably you know, look, I know it was they had some film cinematography in the in the teens or whatever, in the, or uh, the tens or whatever. But it, it's really a twenty at this point forty at nineteen forty. It's a twenty year old medium. So they're still translating from the theater, you know. So right. and when you're in a theater and you're and you're acting. Film actually went and changed the way theater acting is in retrospect. But what was happening there is basically their film, especially Ford, whose whose uh, background was in theater originally, 
what he worked as a usher or whatever in a theater from what i understand he you know that acting style what's that they're bringing all the theater actors and they're acting like almost theatrically in a film and it wasn't until later where things that were audiences got more sophisticated along with the actors where they started having more nuanced um nuanced uh performances and you know speaking lower and you know not having to uh you know project to the person in the back of the room i mean that's where all this stuff like that's basically the style of acting i know again you know it's not it's not modern day acting but you know neither rembrandt's not modern day painting but it's still you know you know what i mean like it's you know yeah i mean max i mean like i mean it goes without saying that if like if this movie if, if this story okay if this book was adapted in the 1970s and you know hal ashby you know or uh you know directed it or and nicholson played tom jode and bruce stern was the preacher and they were telling the story about this family you know from during the great depression you would you would be all over it absolutely and i i know Again, I, I use the opportunity to make fun of all of that. I'm not specifically targeting Grapes of Wrath because I did not think it was a terrible film. I mean, I, I, there were some scenes that I really got into. Like, I loved the scene in the um, <clears throat> coffee shop with the bread and the candy and the pennies and the, and the patrons. Heartbreaking. Yeah, heartbreaking. I thought it was gorgeous. I get it. You know, but then there'd be scenes where a guy would be telling a really long speech. And then everyone goes to bed and like they don't even acknowledge acknowledge this dude. And I'm I'm just laughing. It just it's all just funny to me. But I want to talk about this whole acting argument because I'm gonna tell you something. Mm-hmm. Before I discovered Richard Pryor, before I discovered Carlin as a child, my only comedic influences, the stuff that I would grow up watching as a kid, were Laurel and Hardy shorts. I wasn't really a Stooges guy, sorry, but Laurel and Hardy shorts. Really? Marx Brothers. And um, Abbott and Costello's Frankenstein, really. That's all black and white stuff. Those are <laughs> all, all vaudeville st- movies. All, all vaudeville stuff, by the way. Correct. But Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy, I believed 100%. Even, even when, when Oliver would, you know, break the fourth wall and go, mm, and stare at us, you know, because of something Stanley did. But those two organically, the way they worked together... That, to me, was some of the finest acting I've ever seen. And that was well before this movie comes along or any of these movies. Like a lot of the old horror films, I mean, they're so ridiculous. But I have a love for those old black and white universals. I can watch them again today. I'll still laugh at them. But I think a movie like Son of Frankenstein versus like Bride or uh, the original. I'm talking the James Whale movies. Yeah. But Son of Frankenstein, something else is going on in that movie. Like... Lagozi is totally acting. Not, I mean, he's not acting. Is the point? You know, he's not doing all of his um, pomp and circumstance. He's playing this real dude with a broken neck who's trying to bond with the monster. And you've got like one of your original two misfits fighting each other in a world of shit films. So I just want to make it clear: I'm not so violently opposed to old timey shit. It's just a lot of it to me is so hokey. Yeah. And 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 goofy. That yeah. I, I've got a block, and it's I'm trying like, to yeah. fight through it. It's like but, the but, like the actor's first mission is to act like an actor before he even gets into the character, right? I mean, it's the I I don't know. It's just yeah. I just I, that opening scene where uh, Jode hitches the ride. It was so interesting because it's so like, are they listening to each other? It's more about getting over the you know like you watch the driver, watch the goofy faces he's making, and I and I understand I'm supposed to. You know, I, this is the first scene of the film that's supposed to reel me in. And I'm laughing and I'm rolling my eyes and I'm like, did anyone talk like that really back then in real life? <laughs> I don't know, Joe. You were there, right? <laughs> I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do I do know um, uh, the – oh, shit. What's her, who played the woman? Uh, fuck. Ma, the, Ma she, Jude? Yeah, Manjo. She she did bug me. She was a, Jane Darwell. She was uh she does go a little bit over the top and I know she's seriously revered, but she's got that eye thing or whatever, you know. But but Fonda's an incredible actor, You can man. tell that, that he's ju- trying to break break away from that typical shit that Max is talking about. Yeah, I, I and see and it. and it's in there sometimes too with um oh dude, that Muley character is fucking great too, man. Uh He's in a lot of the Ford friggin' movies too. Um, 
Oh, I can't. I don't know his name right now. But that scene where he's on the oh my god, it's just one of the most. He's that mouse face guy, and he's telling yeah, the story of Muley, losing yeah, his arm. And that scene yeah. with Muley there when he's uh, talking to the bank owners, and they're they're telling him he's got to get off the get off the the land is just freaking amazing. When he he kneels down and grabs the dirt, you know. I mean, that's powerful. It's powerful acting, but more it's powerful subject matter, you know. And that that's where really the power is. Because when you once you start to release yourself into the film, you you just accept it and you accept the film, right. you know, and the style of the film and it's and how it's different than um, you know than all this the the techniques of today. It's it become it becomes a really powerful piece. It you does know? Uh, those low shots of the dude up on the uh, tractor before he runs mm. over the house mm. are just amazing, man. Well, that's it's what you know looking. when. When I took when the only film class I ever took, it was actually an English class. It was an English uh, uh, whatever study, you know, on um, John Ford. This is the only time I have ever studied. It was the first and only time I've ever like formally studied a filmmaker. And um, the way how simply that shot, Tom, like he doesn't overuse. And there's something I do, but he doesn't overuse um, uh, close ups. You know, he's very his compositions are just really simple. Mm-hmm. There's like a simplicity to the way that he films stuff that I was just it's a great introduction to the mechanics of filmmaking and where, you know, now like in these later films what it almost it's almost like cheapened cheapened filmmaking that it's overcut, over edited. Everything's over-cut. like so Everything's zoomed in, like, you know, directing your attention to the smallest nuance of every scene. Every second, like, what's hyper, it's like, it's like... Um, it's coked up. Yeah. And we're, we're here, like, when you watch what he's, do, what, what Ford is doing, you know, like, in that scene that you're talking about, Tom, he's getting away with, with two or three very simple shots, and he's, but nothing's missed, you know? Like, wow. no, like, like everything's very um, articulated, you know? It's just... It's it's just it's the foundations of cinema, you know, and it's it's nice for me to watch it. I I learned a great deal from watching. It, it was and, it was uh, really nice for me too, Joe. I I got to admit, I, I I I the word cinema just kept popping up in my head, like you know, just true cinema just kept popping right. up in my head. I mean, right from the beginning of this film, and it made me think a lot about the stuff I've been watching, you know, particularly the past 10 years and just how unimpressive it is. Well, this dude definitely, you know, of course, John Ford, you know, he influenced so many of the filmmakers that influenced so many of the filmmakers that influenced the filmmakers we watch, you know what I mean? So it's, it's just when you study, when you have such a deep love of the craft, man, it's just, it's just a, it's just a joy to go and watch stuff like this, Billy. So you have trouble with. You, we never really discuss Ford all that much, man. I would love you, to do a John Ford uh, show, actually. <laughs> well, because he's. That, we'll he's, do that after the be, uh, Mutiny on the Bounty yeah. show, though. Yeah, it would be terrible. He directed all three versions of Mutiny on the Bounty, actually. So, uh, <laughs> no, he, listen, man. The first thing that I noticed about this. I, I have the same problem with this that I would have with uh, As I Lay Dying, which is that, you know, I've, I've read the book and, and uh, you know, I have I had a powerful reaction to it and everything. Um, but the first thing that I noticed about this was just how friggin' gorgeous the photography is, you know. And Greg Toland is is also the guy that shot uh, Citizen, Citizen Kane, Kane, right? Yeah. yeah, he's one of the I mean, he's one of the best that he worked that with. Worked. He worked with worked with Ford often and this was their first time collaborating. Actually. Well, and it, like you know, when I was younger I didn't have an appreciation for the way that John Ford constructs a movie, but what Joe is kind of getting at is that uh you know, he does he's a minimalist in a really powerful way that was uh, subtle but really ahead of its time. And it's the same sort of thing that Soderbergh does. And I was just watching an Ingmar Bergman movie the other day and Bergman revered John Ford. And you can totally see how he and Sven Nykvist, you know, kind of borrowed the same structure to their films where you don't have to over you. There's a lot of medium close up. You don't get too close in on faces very often. You save that until it's important. You until save it's important. that until yeah. it's a really powerful moment, and that usually comes later in the movie. And um, 
you know, you you hold one shot as long as you possibly can. If you don't have to cut away, don't cut away. Let it play, you know. And we Ford talked was, about that. Ford was we famous about for saying, Haneke. yeah, and Ford was famous for saying, you know, I I shoot. I shoot to cut when, when I, uh, you know, I, when I send this film into the studio to be cut, I don't want them fucking around with it. You know, to paraphrase him, basically, he said, I don't want them monkeying around with, with my movie, what they get. That's how they have to cut it. Cause there's nothing he, else to cut with, you know, he said once to his editor, yeah, just trim off the edges. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. Exactly. So, but, and the problem I would have with this, uh, with the movie is actually the same problems I would have with the book. I think it's a it's a really phenomenal adaptation, accepting that uh, in the book the book is more of a tragedy than than the movie. They they create a bit of a happy ending version to this movie a little bit. Um, but besides that, I think that it's a uh, I think that the book actually suffers from the same thing that Max is talking about, like the uh, you know the sort of preachiness of it and the the mm. you know the campiness of it a little bit like the book is really preachy and manipulative and and it's powerful but it also pushes it too far like i was reminded in a weird way i know this is a stretch but dancer in the dark the uh, lars von trier movie where mm. you know you take a sympathetic character and then just beat the shit out of him for two hours you know and mm. it sort of it wears thin a little bit but um yeah, it's I mean, a bit of it's a bit of propaganda. It's right? very but, propaganda, which I don't necessarily have a problem with. But it, it, you know, better films are not propaganda. They're just good films. You do know? you find Steinbeck's work uh, in general preachy, uh, Billy? Yeah, he can get he, grapes of wrath. Yeah, he. I think the thing that keeps him from being a greater author is, uh, and he's great. I mean, the guy's the guy's insanely. Yeah, he's John but, Steinbeck. Yeah, he's John yeah. fucking Steinbeck, bitch. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, he he does get pretty preachy at times, which is uh, you know holds him back, I think. So, but I I mean honestly, the the movie John Ford, I've seen so many of his movies, and it's really hit and miss for me. Like, and it just really I think depends on my mood, how receptive I am to the way he makes films. But right. he's very Spielbergian in that he manipulates you unabashedly. Spielberg was a huge Spielberg was a huge fan of the way that yeah. Uh, John Ford shoots his stuff, yeah. especially uh, landscapes, I, yeah. I would say. Too, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's, so he's really super manipulative, and sometimes it works. My favorite Western of all time is The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, which is a late Ford movie. Um, yeah. That was but, one of his last movies, right? That was one of his last, yeah, yeah. And uh, But, you, you know, I don't know. This I, I thought it was a pretty awesome movie. I just think that its shortcomings are right there on its sleeve, you know? And they're pretty much, yeah. I agree with Max. I think that the, some, of this, some of these scenes are just, you roll your eyes like, come on, you know? <laughs> Sorry, Joe. I, no, no, I, I mean, know that's this, all good, man. Is, I, I get it. No, I totally get it. And I probably just, I, pre you know, Tom, when we were in school, it was the first time I really took a serious look at movie making, like ever. Right. You know, I was a big fan, but it was the first time I actually studied it. So I have a bit of a nostalgia thing for John Ford, even though it's funny is that I don't, you know, yeah, all that, uh, like it's a little schmaltzy, especially in some of those westerns. You know, it's like this uh, this syrupy hero type of stuff that he's got going on, and you know this cornbread uh, sense of community and fighting and everything. But I just really lo I love it because I probably have like it's like the first time that I actually it opened my eyes to like that there's somebody actually sitting there what making a movie. You know, yeah. it's the first time that I actually um, looked into it. But that said, about the propaganda issue. I again, this is another thing because politically, this film. Um, um, I, again, I, I spent a lot of my youth as like an angry, uh, you know, socialist or whatever in a lot of ways. <laughs> so like this, this is like this does strike a chord, man. I mean, like what they what Stein both Steinbeck was investigated by the FBI for this, and uh, John Ford oh, was. John really? Ford was investigated. The most conservative like motherfucker in Hollywood was was investigated. Like this, and both of these guys, both and Steinbeck wanted to go. He was trying to go to World War II to fight the Nazis, but they wouldn't let him because of this book that he wrote. You know, so as Smalty and all that stuff, and you know, it's, it's right. You know all that. It's real. This movie like, reminded real. me, like Voltaire said, if you if you want to find out who's in power, just uh, find out who you you're not allowed to criticize. And the fact that all these guys, this big Hollywood production, everyone involved in this ended up being investigated and were afraid of the government. That's insane for making a friggin movie. 
Yeah, well, it was a point in time where the country was it was at in depression because of you know similar shit, greed and avarice and all that bullshit that um, like happened to us a few years ago. Except there was no net back then, you know, there was no FDIC or whatever. I mean, do, I, look, I'm not going to give you a history of the fucking Great Depression. Well, please but, do so, know, Joe. Out of, out of the Great Depression, yeah. I mean, you know, our Get country all Ken was Burns basi- on us, please. It it was basically we were like. There was probably a fair chance that we were going to become a socialist democracy as as opposed to a capitalist democracy. And, of course, all the people, all the capitalists were doing everything they fucking could to to squash that, you know. So when guys like Steinbeck are writing a movie like this, it scared the fucking piss out of them. And then, you know, a dude like Ford, whose politics were actually pretty mixed, he's actually pretty right... I don't know. They're complicated because he's very much an individualist and the individual rises, which, of course, is admirable. But, um, you know, we're like when they these guys are making films like this and Ilya Kazan comes along and steals a copy of this movie to, you know, study while he's making his on the waterfront. You know, this is this is the stuff that these fucking Hoover uh, cronies are friggin' hunting them down and black and MacArthur and blacklisting. So yeah, like right now, it's not real to us. But again, con- like we've been Billy and I have been talking about context recently. You put it in context, and this shit is real. Like it's realer than real. You know, hey, it's just a stuff. Hey Max, I love conspiracy theories. Do you? Um, it depends on what the subject is. Well, listen, I have somebody online right now (laughs) that lives, eat, breathes, drinks, pisses, shits, conspiracy. Max, do you know who this is? Please tell me it's Dave Pace Bonello. It is Mr. Dave Pace. Dave, welcome back to our little program. Reduced to a conspiracy theorist. This is <laughs> this is what I am now. This shambling thing, hooting at people. Dave, it's great, great to have you back on, dude. And it's yeah, great to hear awesome, your voice. Man. Thanks, Tom. Uh, no, it's good. Yeah, yeah, man. It's great to hear everybody. Actually, I was I was really enjoying Joe's talk about it. I didn't even know you were there, dude. It was awesome. awesome. It was really good. I was really digging it. <laughs> Welcome aboard, bro. Max, how much do you miss Dave? I love Dave. I don't understand Dave. You know what? He sent me a little Skype, hey, Max, or something, like weeks and weeks and weeks ago that I never saw. And when I saw it, I felt terrible that I didn't pounce on oh. it. Like, <laughs> But I don't understand, Dave. You, you, I thought you left the show. I thought you were done. Tom texted me, Dave's out. He's leaving the show. And then I got like really <laughs> worried about you. And then... I figured it had to do with the fact that you just had to go rest your mind or take care of your brain or deal with your life or whatever. And yeah. here you are back, and I'm like, well, what is this? Has he quit the show, or is he back on the show? Have you decided yet? Uh, well, no, what, what, I, what I had asked for with, with Tom, and, and <clears throat> Tom and Joe were really understanding about, uh, was just that I, I needed to... Uh, at least spend the rest of the season off uh, because I needed to go do some other stuff. And that other stuff would probably take up a good chunk of my time uh, and make it really hard for me to deliver for the show. And uh, and on top of that, um, it might bring some like negative attention on me uh, and onto the show. So I didn't want to What's I don't want. Example? I don't want to fuck with all that, you know. What's one example of the other stuff? Oh, so I started a blog. Um, I took somebody's advice and started a blog, and uh, it's called La Politique Psychotronique, and uh, it's it's basically about the the horror movie magazine business, and then sort of a behind the scenes look at the issues around the magazine business, the horror you movie. Know, Magazine. You know, it's funny. You, I believe you sent a link to your blog, and the title of your blog, again, is? La Politique Psychotronique. Right. So that scared the living shit out of me and intimidated me, just like <laughs> what is old timey movies do. <laughs> See, all that was supposed to do is make it funny. I actually I picked that name because I, I was like, man, this is like so pretentious. like putting on a Godard film. 
It's oh no! So I, I, I suddenly had a pointy white dunce hat on my head. I'm like, oh god, I can't. <laughs> this obviously isn't for me. This is well above my <laughs> mental capacity. I can't read this. I think Billy felt the same way too, right, Billy? Uh, I I have no idea what any of you are talking about right now. <laughs> 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 Who's Dave Pace? <laughs> Just, yeah. Welcome back, Dave. You should you should be on more shows with us. You know what? I, I'm I would love to be on more shows with you guys. We and, miss... I, and, and now that things are look, even... I quit every other week, so you might as well step in once in a while. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I I just I, I needed to see how things would would be hmm. if I was doing both things, and and just kind of see how difficult or or easy it was going to be. So this and... has nothing to do with your mental darkness, your anguish, your suffering, your torments talking to us this has nothing to do with that it has to do with your creative life uh mostly well i mean but that all has to do with my horrible darkness and suffering <clears throat> all that too so, i guess ultimately but uh so if you're assigned a film to introduce here on the show that becomes more than just having a good time watching the movie and writing the intro it becomes this what does it become for you well, it's, 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 I mean, I'm not going to say it's like it's fucking work like the same way, you know, people are like toiling on the fucking railroad or anything like that. But I mean, it's I you want it to be more than just give it a casual view and, you know, fart out some some stuff about it. You, you know, you want to actually put a bit of bit of effort into it anyway, at least so you don't look like a total fucking idiot. And yeah, I could support that, man. These people fucking don't want to waste your fucking time, you know? Like, people are, last... why am I listening? What am I yeah. listening to here? You know, yeah. like, you want to give them something. You want to be like, we I'm totally had to be some... an expert on this, right? So I better give them something. We totally uh, had yeah. a co host on here for a short period of time that came on and did that. And it was disappointing. <laughs> and you know what? It wasn't me that got on that person or Joe, even. It was Max. Max was thoroughly insulted. <laughs> yeah. Thoroughly. This is the guy who doesn't come on show on the on reviews when he doesn't like the movie, by the way. Oh, that's so unfair. <laughs> Princess Max. Are we come still on, here? <laughs> yes. By, <laughs> by the way, Joe. Never left. Yeah, you you were by right. By the way, Joe. Dave. No, Mr. he did Old the same Tiny. shit today. He did the same shit today. As far as we've come. He didn't want to talk about uh, James Franco's uh, As I Lay Dying. So he's like, oh, I'm very busy today. I'm talking. I had a legitimate job. Listen, this As I Lay Dying, I blame Tom because I checked in with him about a week ago. And he said he's starting it for the third time. He hated it so much. (laughs) That's that put the fear of fucking to me. (laughs) Joe, don't let him. So that when he's, I don't care. Look, so when he's sleeping on his like mattress pile 20, 20 high, you know, trying to figure out if there's a pee underneath it, Princess Max is like, oh, I can't go and talk about um, as I lay dying. I'm going to have to text um, Joe and tell him I can't make it. Is this what? Max? It's not true. Joe, I, I have the film. I was going to watch it this afternoon before the show. I was introducing. <laughs> I took a whole Sunday All to right, watch I the fucking Grapes of Wrath. Okay, I believe you. Now listen to this. <laughs> Let's get back to old timey movies for a second. Oh, no, but I was going to say, well, before I got, I did get to, I just did want to say that, yeah, Tom, I, sometimes I say, look, I'm j- I don't care. I'm just going to write like three paragraphs and introduce the, the movie. And then I just can't do, do it. Exactly what Dave's talking so you about. Have approached- I get all wrapped up into it. I've man. tried to do a lesser job than I do, to be honest. I swear to God. Today, last night, I'm like, fuck it. I'll just wake up tomorrow. I'll write right. three paragraphs and then that'll be right. it, you know? And then I'm up at four o'clock in the morning thinking about this fucking review of As I Lay Dying. What the hell am I going to say? About Billy, do you say? do you have that same those same thoughts sometimes about about your reviews? Like, ah, eh, I'm just going to do a quick and easy thing, and then it's just it becomes way too complicated. Tom, the last two reviews you gave me were Heaven Help Us and Stand Up <laughs> Guys. So you've had an easy time this season. It's been a it's been a fabulous roller coaster ride. It, when I sit down and I think to myself, I'm about to insult some of the greatest actors who ever graced the silver <laughs> screen because he's left me no other choice. I like this new laugh of yours, Tom. What is this? Is, I like so, it. 
the helium. It's like the yeah, the air is coming out of the balloon. Finally, Max. <laughs> man, it's just been in the balloon. <laughs> let the air let out. out man. That's what I'm saying. Hey, let me let me just let me just say. I, first off, I thought my best review this season was Manson, uh, which I thought was a bit of an epic poem. But uh, Max, your review of the Grapes of Wrath is great. Like, even as much as you hated it, it's still like a performance art piece. So I, you know. The, I don't know what to say about that. No one, no one on the show can, even if they hate the movie, can do a bad review because the review comes out more interesting than the film they're reviewing. Sometimes, sometimes well, I got that's confused. true. I got confused because it used to be, uh, or I, I thought it was now introductions, introducing the film. So I've gotten less away from reviews than I have introducing it in a weird way or whatever. So are we reviewing films? <laughs> Yeah, or are you know, we that's, a, that's very interesting that that Max says that because like, yeah, I, to me it's like I don't want to like I want to review the film with with everyone on the panel. I don't, you know, so I think that Max kind of has, you know, he's got the right thing there. Well, I would just say that I, I the way that I think about it is that whatever anybody wants to look. You, we, uh, we love each other. We all trust each other. We have great respect for each other. So whatever I, I, any of you guys want to say about it, yeah. say whatever the Everybody fuck you want to say. Everybody has their own style. You know, I don't want to look, and I know you feel pressure sometimes, Tom, about these reviews. It doesn't. It shouldn't be a, like well, like I when said. You're working I, on a show with Billy Barassa and Joe Christiana and Dave Pace and Max Cook. You know, talented people, really well, talented people who write these beautiful reviews a plus reviews and then you just got me sitting here max oh come the hot on. air is you, you're full of shit you That's talk about bullshit. hot air you're full of shit why are you any less talented? and hot air that's how i feel i do i feel like I'm... so it's not going to take the validation of your co-hosts to to snap you out of your fucking coma it's gonna take what tom, tom a large straight up a large breasted brunette this is what I'm talking about. I was just about to say that. Abuse. I, I need say, abuse. You need, to, you need to get some motherfucking pussy out of this thing. Okay? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I do like that you How much pussy attacked. is in the podcast game? Tom, I do like that you personally attacked a minor figure in a documentary. Uh, you spent your entire <laughs> review saying fuck you to a character in a documentary uh, a couple shows back. See, and shows giggling about it like I- I'm-, I'm crazy or something. No, because it's great. I love that you did that, and I love that Billy <laughs> points it out. Yeah, cool. it's again, know. it's like it's like a it's performance art piece. Billy, you and I need, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you and I need to talk more, Billy. Honestly, <laughs> off the show. All right, we, do. we need to, we need to spend more time talking. He you said it scares him to talk to you more. Did he really, Max? This did. Why? Did, Why are, are you, you drinking afraid of that? Are you drinking beer these days, Tom? Well, I I do drink. Are beer. you yeah. off of everything? I drink beer, yeah. You know, I, I thought love... you were in like physical therapy of some kind. No, I'm I'm healthy as, I'm probably just a little bit less healthy. <laughs> <than> Joe, <laughs> Dave, what'd you think of Graves of Wrath? What are you hosting the show now, Joe? <laughs> Someone has. Is that no? I'm just curious. That that's all. I thought on? we were having a free form conversation. I thought <laughs> yes, like that that form. that question just popped out of thin air. Let me tell you about Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> I gotta tell you something about Grape Night. You set me up there, and I got nothing. Have you ever seen it? (laughs) Yeah, of course I've seen it. It's fucking the movie's fantastic, and 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 I'll never understand. I'll never understand why Tom Joad was never like like a big hero in 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 American folklore. You know what I mean? Like, I you know what I am wondering the same thing. But there's something honestly off putting to me about that character that I can't put my finger on. And Henry Fonda does as awesome a job as portraying that character. You know, but I mean, he he lives on folklore like Bruce Springsteen wrote songs about him and shit. I mean, obviously he floats through American, you know, whatever. Yeah, but he was recently paroled. I mean, so that's that's kind of shady right there, right? But, yeah, well, yeah, but Dave, th- that's a good point. Why isn't he more of a folk hero? The, the the people who should be following the example of Tom Joad, and 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 ultimately, I think that you know, forgive me for fucking saying this and being a filthy communist, but 
I, I think ultimately that leads to the labor movement. Am I wrong or, or am I wrong here? You, you, you know what I mean? Like, like if you were to follow in the footsteps of Tom Joe, you would you would fall into the arms of some kind of trade union or, or something like that. Some kind of commie bullshit. But that's that's <laughs> where that's the whole where... treatise of the book is 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 about, you know, shared wealth. I mean, that's basically it, it, exactly so commie bullshit. Right. So. And, and this is this is what I don't understand is all these people who who decided, ah, I'm not down with all that commie bullshit. I'm not with all that communist talk. Are the ones being utterly fucked in the ass, you, you, you know, by, right. by the by the capitalist system. Right. right? Isn't like, that a man? Dave? Great point. That's a great point. Joe. Like these motherfuckers yep. rotting away in the heartland of America where where literally the most giant shit was ever taken on a class of people just sprayed diarrhea all over these fucking people and absolutely and all of them are are just I don't buy why you left the show. I don't buy it. <laughs> we just Max give, could give a most... fuck. Max could give one flying fuck about the grapes of wrath, Steinbeck, well, and socialism. You flavor. see, oh, no, I love of mice and men. You guys, I love it. But no. but Dave, oh, I don't buy one. your reason for leaving the show. What do you mean you don't buy my reason? <laughs> what, what's there to buy? What am I selling? Le double que good de ciel, but the, forget all yeah. the French Canadian shit. Fuck that. Okay. Well, let's let's Tom, talk about. We were about... almost talking about the movie again. Almost, almost made it there. <laughs> but first, back to fuck the French Canadians. <laughs> I'm sorry. You were talking about the shit spray all over the the poor people. Go on. I, I was just, there... I was just explaining that I think the I, I think that the class of people that most rejected you know, that Tom Joe narrative, right? Uh, are the people so utterly fucked by the people they ended up getting into bed with, you, you know? Yeah, there, it's there's, pretty a amazing. Great scene. there's a great scene in the in the film, actually, that kind of represents that or illustrates that uh, when they're in the, uh, we're in the peach picking farm or whatever, and they're talking about, um, you know, they, they had the wages were at one thing, five cents, I think, and then they then once they had them all in there and they were working, they lowered them down, them down to two and a half yeah, cents. Half. And even even Tom Joad, you know, this we're learning all of this along with Tom Joad, but he says, well, we're getting five cents now. And then, you know, well, we're looking out for our own, you know, and that's sort of what's at the heart of this is that, yeah. you, you know, you need to you need to sacrifice a little bit in order to um, gain a lot. That you peach know? farm has become uh, Walmart and McDonald's, you know, Absolutely. for sure, for sure. There's no question. And, and the funny thing is, is that all these fucking assholes stumbling around covered in shit uh, are are. Are like yeah. total right wing maniacs now, yeah. Yeah, Billy, and they're even well, more in bed with these fuckers. Steinbeck Billy, himself yeah. said, uh, "There are no poor people in America; only temporarily inconvenienced millionaires." So <laughs> yeah. he's like, "Their day's coming even, anytime." Even back then, it was you know he was keenly aware. And this is kind of my problem with Grapes of Wrath a little bit, both book and movie form, is that he I feel like he's talking down to us a little bit, like he's he's walking us through a Sunday school version of why. Uh, form of socialism would work, which I have no problem with. But, you know, it when you feel that you're being taught something like from a tract, then it, it right. feels meh, it kind of goes and eh, just whatever, you know, and no matter how much you agree with what the guy's saying, you know. But even back then, he was keenly aware that the problem lay in the individual and the individual believes somewhere in the back of their head that they're going to be, uh, you know, King Tut eating a you know plate full of grapes and and a rack of lamb just one day you know and and if they can get ahead of everyone else then that shining goal will arrive one day you know and mm -hmm. uh, and he was like pleading for uh, you know sanity against that that temptation but that well there uh, out. There... we were kids are making fucking twelve cents an hour at McDonald's and can't even afford to eat there you know right well that's mm -hmm. the thing with the you know you compare so wonderfully the. Uh, Peach Farm and, and uh, the Grapes of Wrath would say a Walmart or, or a McDonald's. Walmart, uh, really even better because if when you're watching the Grapes of Wrath and you see this family working their ass off on, on this peach farm getting paid so little, the only place that they could go to and spend their money is at that, that you know, the, the, family, sto the, the store the on the farm, the company, yeah. the company store. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's like the started. same thing with like, you know, Walmart workers. It's like, you know, they get their paychecks and the only place they can spend their paychecks is at Walmart. So Walmart's essentially keeping all the fucking money. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, it's not just what the Walmarts you? either. The, the, I just I, I read a thing about, about Prada and how Prada was forcing employees to buy Prada <laughs> products to boost their sales numbers so they would hit their targets. Oh Jesus! <laughs> no fucking shit. And and and, the, and they're not asking like the just the executives to do this. This is like the fucking, you know, street level, you know, working in a boutique, making not a whole hell of a lot of money. People, it's it's yeah. fucking crazy. Fucking Prada. I just sent Joe uh, a link to an article. Perhaps he can post it on this show about the revolving door of unemployment. And there's this woman who's been out there trying to find a job. And she was basically told by one employer during an interview, uh, we don't hire the unemployed. And you look at all of these people in Grapes of Wrath, and you, you, you look at their, oh, yeah, we don't hire the unemployed. She couldn't get a job at McDonald's because she was too uh, literate. or Yeah, literate. Um, but you look at these folks in the Grapes of Wrath, and I, I don't know. I, maybe I would like another interpretation of this film, especially for today. I, you know, maybe maybe something could be done. I mean, I, I don't have high hopes because I am with you guys 100% on modern movies. I don't go to the theater anymore. I've seen two, three movies tops in the theaters uh, this year, and and Bad Grandpa was twice. I don't go to the <laughs> I mean, that's what I need now. But let me let me go back to something about the film, Joe, because there was a, a very curious moment when Tom first comes home and Ma Joe comes to greet him and they're having that little yeah. conversation. They don't touch. Yeah. They do yeah. that weird little awkward weird, handshake. Isn't it? What is that? Yeah. I, you know, I think that's the um, I think that's Ford, man. I, I, I could be wrong, but I think it's Ford's like stoicism. Like it's the male uh, reluctancy to show affection. Like physical affection, I think it's his idea of what um, it's a masculine his, jerk off. Yeah, I think it's his. Yeah, I think it's, it has something to do with that masculine uh, hero thing. And then you know, even men she says, you know, women are women and never change. Yeah, shall meet. <laughs> yeah. Except yeah, at the I think end, that's part a of kiss it. goodbye, Ma. All right. Before I put on end, my yeah. cap and walk off into the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's even inherent in um in Steinbeck's novel. I think like, and even in the in the movie form, is that there's like one of the main themes is the difference between men and women and how they're different. Uh, women are better able to adapt, and men are too rigid and too uh, set in their ways, and you know, not malleable enough. You know, and I think I think that man woman thing has a lot to do with it. And, you know, that, hey I, Dave, are you close to your mommy? Um, no, no, I wouldn't say that. Not at all. Do you ever talk to her? Yeah, I, I, I talked to her. Uh, she left a voicemail for me today. <laughs> Can you play that voicemail for us, please? <laughs> no. So you just had two completely different reactions. Dave, uh, are you close to your mommy? No, no, I'm not close to her. Well, do you talk to her? Oh, yeah, yeah, I talked to her today. So wait a second. <laughs> Where are we with mom? Is it like my mother? Like you never talk to her, and when you do, it's no. I mean, pleasant? it's yeah. It, it, I mean, we 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 talk like I don't know, maybe once a month. That's about it's... when I, as much as I talk to my mother. Yeah, if yeah. Not. It's about well, it's like once a month. You Is know, she we'll far talk. away from you? No, she's like like a ten minute drive. <laughs> so she's a ten minute drive. So does she ever see the grandkids? Uh yeah. Like she'll she'll you know come over on but holidays. But not you. And, Shit like that. Uh, no, she doesn't leave the house much. Because she's a recluse? Because she's a hoarder? Because she's... She's a little bit of a recluse. Okay, so you always have to bring the kids to her then? Yeah, or I have to, like, like coax her out of the house somehow with, like, you know, dinner. Is, is your dad still around? Yeah, yeah. Does he, does he live with mom? No. Okay. And is he out there and living life and enjoying, or is he a recluse? No, he's he's good. He's he's doing all right. So you're close to him. You no, guess. not really. Not really. So you're not... I talk to him a lot less than I talk to my mother, actually. Oh, so so you talk to your dad less than you talk to your mom, but you seemed yeah. a little more jovial talking about your dad. But you're not close to your parents, right? It's weird, isn't it? So what happened? What do you mean? What happened? 
what happened between you and your folks? Is it just the family dynamic? Because yeah, we're talking it's, about it's, families. It's, it's, and I guess it's just how it ended up. Uh, you know, I'm adopted. My brother and I are both adopted. Okay. So, so, so there's that. So like the obligation was within the first 18 years. Yeah, but yeah. Because basically. there isn't that DNA attachment, they've yeah. done their job, they gave you a life, and they're done. Yeah, basically. So you were adopted. So were they, they find you in an orphanage? Uh, well, basically, actually, as I'm told. Uh, I mean, they didn't, like, find me in an orphanage. I mean, there's, like, waiting lists and shit that you have to... Have so to go, just you, high demand for, for... Did you ever go through that thing where you had to know who your biological folks were? Never. And and why do Never some people who are adopted feel like they have to do that? Because I think that's really fucking annoying when, when they do that. The the ones yeah, that are know. And the ones that don't. Is it just a personality thing, or...? I, I think I, I don't know because for like for me don't get me wrong there are some days where I'm definitely like it would be really interesting to see what my father looks like you know just to or see what you, he looks like yeah just to even see what he looks like Not just to know to who able, he is just to just look to be at like him. I know what my dad looks like like I know what the guy looks like Do you know, what, know what his name what is looks like I have no idea what their names are or anything and and so I, I get that. Like every now and again, I'm like, I get that. And I understand people being curious. I understand it, it, well, yeah, you have to be. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you, something. my mother was adopted, uh, gentlemen. So I, you know, she don't, she never met her real uh, mother and father. So as her son, you know, I experienced that kind of curiosity every every once in a while. Of who my other half of my family is? I have no fucking idea. A whole side of a family, no idea. You know, and, you know, once in a while you think to yourself, well, I'd be curious to, to see, you know, who these people are, or what they look like. But, you know, I got to be honest with you, Dave, I don't think about it that much, you know, yeah. once in a while, once in a long while, I'll think of it. Yeah. You know, it, like it, now, it, now I'm thinking of it, but. it. It doesn't get at me too much. You, you know, my my wife is really she's really interested, like like she's been like Googling around and shit like that. And... Oh, God. Do you like that? Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, she she likes it, so uh, you know, I like it. <laughs> she's she's googling around about you because she's into you. Yeah, well, and she was trying to find you know who my birth parents are. Wow, you know, that sort of now thing. now weird. you could care less. You could care less than more because you're a dad, and it's like, you know, you've got to put your energies into your kids. Yeah, I'm frankly, I've got other shit to do, uh, but. Yeah, and I and I don't feel like I don't have parents, you know. Like I I, I had parents, uh, right? You know, they don't happen to be biologically related to me, and then that may be a factor in our long estrangement. I don't know, uh, but you know, when I was a kid, I had parents, and they were they were good people to me, and I certainly could have done a lot worse. Yeah, and the fact so. that they adopted both you <laughs> and your brother—that's double trouble. Yeah. So they're and, bringing it. Is your brother older or younger? He's younger than me. Uh, he's younger than me, and he's black. Oh! You have a black <laughs> brother? Oh, Max, oh, we've shit. been through this like a year ago. <laughs> yeah. Max isn't paying attention. He's like he one of those old band. people, the grapes of wrath. <laughs> he just. <laughs> just give me, give me, give me, give me. He smells the spare ribs. Go swim in a lake. <laughs> Go swim in a lake, Max. Was I there for the black brother conversation? Yes, we've had I'm this pretty, conversation. I'm pretty sure you were. Yeah. Who else would get that information out of him? What do you think? Joe's going to go digging around? <laughs> the opinion. prosecution rests. <laughs> God damn it. Hey, guys, listen. Hey, Dave, you're going to stick uh, stick on board and do a uh, vacation with us? Yeah, absolutely. But I, I just wanted to say one thing about Grapes of Wrath because I need to get this off my chest. It's been okay. bothering me for a long time. And it's one of the reasons I was like, I want to talk about the Grapes of Wrath. So this is utterly unrelated to the film, The Grapes of Wrath. Uh, so for the fans of the film who may want to hear some stuff about it you can tune out now this has nothing to do with you oh, uh, they've tuned out long ago <laughs> <laughs> so I, i'm the i'm glad i'm the guy who comes on and just drags the show to a screeching halt that no. Was, uh but no i what i want to complain about i'm kidding i was kidding is the stage play i want to complain about this stage play i i, I was at a at a at a thespian conference uh, in, in Muncie, Indiana, when I was in high school and we had to go, I, I, I was one of these guys who would like not skip going to the shows. Like I skipped going to all the workshops and shit. Cause that's bullshit. Uh, you know, I just wanted to go and fucking party, but 
I went to all the shows. Like I felt really obligated to go to all the shows as opposed to skipping them and partying with people. So I fucking watched this production of the grapes of wrath, uh, where they had like a, this awesome, like, like model T Ford prop on the stage. And it looked really realistic. The costumes were amazing. And it was the most boring ass bullshit ever. And it just went on and fucking on and fucking on. Like this had to been like three hours. It, it was unfucking bearable. And I'm pretty sure everybody in the audience wanted to kill themselves. Cause I mean, you know, great. It, it had great production values, but this is still a high school production of the Grapes of Wrath we're talking about. And so you've got a theater full of probably about 10,000 just really upset people who are like, fuck, I should have skipped this. Why aren't I skipping this? You know, why? Why do I have to be respectful of why I'm here? Uh, so, yeah, I wanted to bitch about that. It was god awful. Uh, so it really like honestly, it was like I'm never watching this movie, I'm, and which I did later on in life. and I'm glad I did. But I really, really put me against the film. Uh, put me against the book. Uh, I wanted to burn the book in the streets. Oh my God, it was it, it was. It, but you know what? It was only half as irritating as the production of Oklahoma I saw at the same one. That there wasn't me... singing in the Grapes of Wrath. Yeah, was right. There? Exactly. No, there was no singing in the Grapes of Wrath. So imagine, imagine a three-hour production of Oklahoma, where then they come out and like reprise every song in the fucking show, every mm. song in the show. It, 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 so it stretched out to like four, four and a half hours. It was oh. unfucking bearable. Three intermissions. Uh, <laughs> three fucking intermissions. Jesus. I'm not kidding. I'm not all, kidding. All theater is terrible. All theater is terrible. Three fucking intermissions. These motherfuckers. They were from Hawaii, these motherfuckers. They, they, they built like a big farmhouse on the stage. Their set was amazing. It was fuck. It moved around and shit. They had to bring it in on motherfucking tractor trailers. Jesus that came over on a ship from fucking Hawaii. Like, like it was unbelievable for high school, like these high school theater kids who were like, they, they you know, they, let's face it. They're not great actors. You, you know, not all of them are, are going to pass through the eye of the needle. So you're not seeing, you know, it, oh God, it was fucking unbearable, but no me, I'm the stupid guy who goes to all of them. <laughs> you know, I'm obligated. Oh <laughs> There's yeah. only one good play and that's true. West starring Gary Sinise and John Malkovich. Oh, it's those best. two, those two made of mice and men together. Now yeah. that is a Steinbeck film that must be seen to be believed. That is a beautiful, powerful, beautifully acted film. That's the one we should be talking about. Fucking true West, <laughs> man. Oh. Dave right. has a black brother. It's all coming back. <laughs> yeah, now, oh, yeah. old what fuck. kind of black is he, Dave? Is he eggplant black? Is he caramel? He's 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 like West Indian. Right. So, he, oh, he's and like, you're close to him. Um, I mean, we talk every Are now and again. Parents black? I buy weed off him sometimes. You do? <laughs> of course. Are your does. parents black? <laughs> no, no, they are very white. And, and we came up in a very, very white northern Ontario community. Uh, so it was. What's it was going weird. on? Where's Air up there in Toronto? What's his deal? I. I told my wife that actually I think Dave Pace is actually the mayor up there, and that's why he had to leave the show. <laughs> hey, hey, guys, yeah, your whole your whole leave the show thing I still don't understand. I, I don't. Um, you want to move on to vacation? Let's get into the mayor of Toronto and more Dave Pace. But hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. You guys are killing me. <laughs> We're talking about about John Joe and Ford. Billy. I'll tell you right now they're killing me right now. Who, yeah, Tom, that? you really got to, you know, you got to be a host, man. You got to move this thing along. Quit fucking around already. Tom, Tom, <laughs> Tom, you said this. You said that the editing today is all coked up. Yeah. Right? And I was going to say Ford is all coked up as well. See? I was going to tie it all in there. That's how I was going to do that. That's how that, I was. That's it, Dave. That's that was it. Before, that was before I got cut off and fucking <laughs> Windows 8. Fuck you, Windows 8. Seriously. Fuck Windows 8. If you have Windows 8, fuck it. Fuck you. Windows 8. Are are you wearing? Are you a boxer man or a? I know I'm talking on Skype right now, so Microsoft. Do you wear boxers or do you so wear uh, fuck, bikini fuck briefs? Fuck you, Windows 8. Fuck it. Suck you don't wear dick. those tidy whiteies, do you? No, man. <laughs> Dave came on to say that the high school production in Muncie, Indiana, of <laughs> The Grapes of Wrath in Oklahoma was not good, and neither is Windows 8. Okay. It was fucking bullshit. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, guys, let's move on. It's family road trips, and this is our final segment of the season. We got Dave Pace back with us tonight. Max Cook is here. Billy Barasa, Joe Christiana, the whole crew is hanging out. I will be introducing National Lampoon's Vacation, and here... What's wrong, little Billy? What seems to be troubling you? What you doing, Pa? Why, I'm a watching John Ford's 1940 film classic, The Grapes of Wrath. Why are you watching that, Pa? Well, cause Joe Christiana seems to believe <laughs> Well, this is an important work of cinematic art that should be discussed thoroughly, I reckon, on the Cutting Room Movie Podcast. What's a podcast, Pa? Well, it's kind of hard to say. A podcast is sort of like a radio show, a show that's on the radio, only it's on the internet instead. Does that mean we'll be a hearing an Ovaltine commercial soon? Oh, no, no, no. It's not that kind of radio, with, like, advertising dollars and such to spare. You see, this radio show's more free-like. Anyone can listen to it for free, if they have a computer. Wow, I like when things are free. Well, many of us do, little Billy. I'd imagine the Jode family sure did. The Toad family, Pa? No, 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 no. No, the Jode family. The Jode family were kicked off their land during the Great Depression, and so they slowly traveled to California to get jobs as migrant workers, which also didn't pay them much of a wage. Well, if it was called the Great Depression and it was so sad, what was so great about it? That's a very good question, Billy. I can't rightly say why at this juncture. Just know that these people were very sad and with little to no money at all. And when they come across nice people that were giving things for free, it gave them a little hope, even though they were chock full of pride. Like our hero, Tom Joad, even though he was paroled for doing something very bad to someone, he still wound up being something of a hero. What was he in jail for, Pa, that he got paroled? You know what paroled means? I do, Pa. I saw something about it in a newsreel. Well, Tom Joad served time for homicide. Is that like a crime for killing queers? Oh, no, 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 no. It was a more self-defense killing. But in the movie, Tom Joad, played by Henry Fonda, who was barely in the middle part of the movie, was set free. And it all comes back around to things that are free, doesn't it, Pa? Why, yes, little Billy. Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> Was the grapes of wrath free? Or did you have to buy a ticket to it? Oh, well, no. You see, nothing's free nowadays, little Billy. If you want to see a movie like The Grapes of Wrath, you still have to pay for it, like through a service such as Netflix. Although Netflix, of course, couldn't barely even find a copy of The Grapes of Wrath to send me to watch. And that's why your old paw had to wait days and days and days for it. Because there are so few copies of it actually being rented that I had to be put in a holding pattern to wait for my copy to come. And now that it has come and I am finally able to watch it, I have no doubt that I will send it back to Netflix right away when I'm finished with it. I won't even ask what the special features are on the disc. Aw, oh, Jay, why is that, Pa? Is it not a good movie? Oh, no, I mean, well, it has historical significance. That sounds boring, Pa, gee whiz. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just say the movie's from another time and place. <laughs> you say it, it's an old-timey movie, Pa? <laughs> well, I did notice when Tom Jode and the not-so-preacher man were walking up to the Jode house outside, you could hear their voices sounding off in like an echoey-type fashion, as if they weren't so much outdoors as they were, well, inside a 20th Century Fox soundstage down in Culver City. I get sleepy just hearing about it, Paul! <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it's a good idea to go to bed then, little Billy. Because if you keep talking to me in that hateful, grating, annoying, old-timey way of yours, why, I'll either kill you or fall asleep myself. Aw, oh, Jay! <laughs> nah, I'm just jesting, little Billy. You go on now. Paul's going <clears> to <throat> finish this two-hour and eight-minute movie now <laughs> about a family of ragamuffins and rustabouts with lots of big speeches that really go nowhere. 
<laughs> that's a jibber jabber, jibberin' and jabberin' and well, it really doesn't sink its dramatic hooks into a jaded so-called cinema lover such as myself. Oh, and the shame I feel for staring at the ceiling while Grandma's stinky corpse funks up the covered wagon, just like Aunt Edna's does in National Lampoon's Vacation, <laughs> a far superior film. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? Yes, Billy. I found an old VHS cassette from the 80s Ma had. Something about the Jane Fonda workout. Did you now? And whatever did you do with that tape, Billy? I played with myself to it, Pa. I couldn't help it. Those Fondas are some Hollywood family, ain't they, Pa? Yes, little Billy. Yes, they are. Uh-oh. Here comes Grandpa. Hide. <laughs> I smell spare ribs. Somebody's been eating spare ribs. How come I ain't got none? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Is that the is that it? Is that the end? Is that the climax? <laughs> That's the climax. <laughs> uh, wow. Take that, John Steinbeck and Ford. Yeah. Henry Fonda. <laughs> John Carradine, you fucking hacks, <laughs> piss on their graves. Oh my god! What do I say? Where do I go? What do I do? What's gonna happen for the next thirty minutes? <laughs> we just move on to National Lampoon's Vacation. Wow, A far superior film. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, Joe, do you have any questions for the man? <laughs> that actually, that's exactly what my review sounded like for uh, "As I Lay, lay Dying," Max. <laughs> Is that <laughs> true? <laughs> yeah. Except the elder man was uh, asking the child questions. <laughs> wow, really? <laughs> wow, man. That uh, I don't know, Tom. You're the leader of the I show. Know, Max. Do something. Well, listen, here. <laughs> do something. We're, we're all. We're all. Listen, we're all familiar with Max's uh, disdain towards uh, classical films. Max, it's true that you call uh, Turner Classic Movies the TCM. You <laughs> call it total, what is it, total crap marathon? <laughs> is this true? <clears throat> Listen, here's what I think we should do. Okay. One of these days, we should seriously, like, take all three versions Forget a new release. Let's take all three versions, and I think there might be more, of Mutiny on the Bounty. What do you got? You got Mutiny on the Bounty. You got Mutiny on the Bounty with uh, the first one was with Lawton, right? Then you got Lawton and Gable. Lawton and Clark Gable, yeah. Correct. Right. Then, you, then we'll do, um, Brand, we'll do Brando. Brando. Yeah. Brando. And and who was who was Mel Bly Gibson. in that one? Mel Gibson and oh I don't know. And then Mel Gibson and Hopkins in the Bounty, okay? Mm -hmm. And we we go through the story and how it's told in all these different generational times, but we each have to actually read the novel first. So we have to read the novel and then we have to watch the three versions of the film or the three versions, cinematic versions of the novel, and then have like an epic conversation. This is what he got out of the Grapes of Wrath, Joe. Mutiny on the Bounty. I, Jesus <laughs> He's just running for the nearest other film that's not the Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> well, <laughs> anything will do. Yeah. Lawrence well, fucking Arabia, anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, I will say, Tom, can I do what? No, I, no are you gonna... somebody go. I'm so All right. Well, you're here. supposed to direct the show. Jesus. Uh, well, I will say that what you're saying there about Mutiny on the Bounty is, is applicable here. I mean, you have to look at the movies within the context of, from which they are made, you know? So I don't even want to say you have to make allowances because I think that the film, I, look, man, I think the film is incredibly beautiful as Absolutely. it is. I feel, no, no, it's you're like, saying oh, like that, that, that if I... But it's like, I feel almost embarrassed saying that now because I think it's embarrassing. It's beautiful. But uh, also, like, I try, I know that... Well, that's um, that's to, preposterous and you know well, just to ex ridiculous. Well, just to explain why I picked this and why I was hoping that you would... Uh, like I wanted to share with you, show it to you, or whatever was was basically because I know that you you don't like watching the old movies, you know. So like I picked one that I thought was like one that stood the test of time or whatever, and you know that was actually going to work that you might um, you know get something out of. But I, I you got geez, nothing, man. Joe. I, no, I would I know. not have guessed 
in advance that Max would like The Grapes of Wrath. It is uh, Max. I love old movies and and The Grapes of Wrath and John Ford in general. Great on my nerves sometimes, like you cannot believe. And it's that old timey shit. It's that canned. It's like John Ford was always too fucking cute in in certain things. Like it's just he cranked it up to cartoony levels on the the kids and the old people and the pathos and the well gee the comedy gee whiz it sure is a pretty land we're looking at and you're like oh for fuck's sake you know just (laughs) you don't have to crank it up to 11 on every fucking scene you know well listen i know it appears like i took a giant shit on the grapes of wrath but (laughs) i really i i didn't hate it it just wasn't (laughs) it would be hard to determine that from the review that you gave it just (laughs) <laughs> it was just it was just I, I I'm sure if I lived in that time and I went out to the movies at night with my wife and we sat in the theater and we watched a newsreel and a short and a cartoon and then next thing you know I'm sure I would have had a much more profound experience. But look, look at the Greg Tolan cinematography is captivating. That first that opening shot, that first shot, you I'm just already like reeled in on this one i think well there's a good place yeah, to start no. tom yeah it, the, it was, the cinematography like, uh... is a good place to start in i heard yeah for sure i mean the i like that scene like early in the movie too with the candles oh. was just freaking i i mean it's just uh it's just like something really beautiful to me it, you know? the camera work is extraordinary and the direction of the camera work is equally extraordinary i was i i, I love this movie i never saw it before Oh really? And I sat oh, there good. for two so then, hours, okay. and it the two hour. I swear, and Max, I'm always with you usually on on uh, on these old films. I, I'm not into them. Joe knows this. Anything before 1960, I go into them like I'm not gonna like it. Like I just I have a sour taste in my mouth before I even start screening the film. Same thing here. Opening shot right away. I'm in. I was like, this is just fucking beautiful. This is going to be beautiful. And I was in a great mood. And Henry Fonda, who I totally adore. I, to me, this, this performance by Henry Fonda is outstanding. You know, I mean, to me, it's almost as good as his last performance, which I think is the best one that I've seen. And that's and on Golden Pond, another movie I love. But I, I totally got into this movie. I mean, I felt I was there and I felt for this family. You know, and I hated the government. I hated the landowners. I hated what was going on. And I felt bad that these people were, like, moving around, constantly moving around, just trying to find home, just trying to find home. And it, it eluded them. I'm in on this one, Joe. Thanks for bringing it to the table. Dude. Yeah, well, I'm glad that it, that it worked, man, because, like, I just – honestly, we don't cover enough old movies, and I, I get sure. so I, – I bring them with such trepidation out because – you know they're open to such ridicule, I guess, because of the um, the time difference thing. You know, but I, I mean, I I honestly think that it's a lot like a lot of things, man. Like I don't know, certain types of food, acquired taste, whatever. When you start watching movie old movies, you start to like your you, your uh, your defenses start to wear down a little bit, and you start to accept them on their own terms a little bit. And again, it's that sure. context thing. I think that's I, what I it's about, so. and that's what I'm slowly learning about anything before 1960 which i have a hard time relating to being born in yeah. the 70s like you know yeah. i'm like you know it's just a, trying to accept them on their own terms like let me tom yeah. do you have trouble listening to music before like you know before the 70s and 60s absolutely not yeah no absolutely not so is it is it like is it particularly listen, film you know, that you have trouble with like nothing else particularly bothers you Art wise, that's made before the 70s and 60s? I think the problem I have, and this is what I think Max really drives on, is just the camp, the campiness of the acting. Mm. You know, it's just. It's just not there yet. You know, it's not until, what, who Brando comes along where, where the scene really starts to James Dean, Marlon Brando, guys like this, Paul Newman. This, this is when it starts to change, right? It's true. It's true, man. But you have to, again, it's a context thing, right? So if film is probably, you know, 
look, I know it was they had some film cinematography in the in the teens or whatever, in the, or uh, the tens or whatever. But it, it's really a twenty at this point forty a nineteen forty. It's a twenty year old medium, so they're still translating from the theater, you know. So right. and when you're in a theater and you're and you're acting. Film actually went and changed the way theater acting is in retrospect. But what was happening there is basically their film, especially Ford, whose whose uh, background was in theater originally. What he worked as a usher or whatever in a theater, from what I understand. He, you know, that acting style. What's it, that? They're bringing all the theater actors and they're acting like almost theatrically in a film. And it wasn't until later where things where audiences got more sophisticated along with the actors where they started having more nuanced um nuanced uh performances and you know speaking lower and you know not having to uh you know project to the person in the back of the room i mean that's where all this stuff like that's basically the style of acting i know again you know it's not it's not modern day acting but you know neither rembrandt's not modern day painting but it's still you know You know what I mean? Like it's, you know. Yeah, I mean, Max. I mean, like, I mean, it goes without saying that if, like, if this movie, if if this story, okay, if this book was adapted in the 1970s, and you know, Hal Ashby, you know, or uh, you know, directed it, or and Nicholson played Tom Joad, and Bruce Dern was the preacher, and they were telling the story about this family, you know, during the Great Depression, you would, you would be all over. Absolutely, and I, I know. Again, I, I use the opportunity to make fun of all of that. I'm not specifically targeting Grapes of Wrath because I did not think it was a terrible film. I mean, I, I, there were some scenes that I really got into. Like, I loved the scene in the um, <clears throat> coffee shop with the bread and the candy and the pennies and the, yeah, and the patrons. Heartbreaking. Yeah, heartbreaking. I thought it was gorgeous. I get it. You know, but then there'd be scenes where a guy would be telling a really long speech. And then everyone goes to bed, and like they don't even acknowledge acknowledge this dude. And I'm I'm just laughing. It just it's all just funny to me. But I want to talk about this whole acting argument because I'm going to tell you something. Mm-hmm. Before I discovered Richard Pryor, before I discovered Carlin as a child, my only comedic influences, the stuff that I would grow up watching as a kid, were Laurel and Hardy shorts. I wasn't really a Stooges guy, sorry, but Laurel and Hardy shorts. Really, Marx Brothers. And um, Abbott and Costello's Frankenstein, really. That's all black and white stuff. Those are <coughs> all, all vaudeville stuff. Movies. All, all vaudeville stuff, by the way. Correct. But Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy, I believed one hundred percent. Even even when when Oliver would you know break the fourth wall and go mm, and stare at us, you know, because of something Stanley did. But those two organically, the way they worked together. That, to me, was some of the finest acting I've ever seen. And that was well before this movie comes along or any of these movies. Like a lot of the old horror films, I mean, they're so ridiculous. But I have a love for those old black and white universals. I can watch them again today. I'll still laugh at them. But I think a movie like Son of Frankenstein versus like Bride or uh, the original. I'm talking the James Whale movies. Yeah. But Son of Frankenstein, something else is going on in that movie. Like, Lugosi is totally acting. Not, I mean, he's not acting is the point. You know, he's not doing all of his um, pomp and circumstance. He's playing this real dude with a broken neck who's trying to bond with the monster. And you've got, like, one of your original two misfits fighting each other in a world of shit films. So I just want to make it clear. I'm not so violently opposed to old-timey shit. It's just a lot of it to me is so hokey. yeah. And 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 goofy. Yeah, I, I've got a block, and it's I'm trying like, to yeah. fight through it. It's like but, the but, like the actor's first mission is to act like an actor before he even gets into the character, right? I mean, it's the I I don't know. It's just yeah. I just I, that opening scene where uh, Jode hitches the ride. It was so interesting because it's so like, are they listening to each other? It's more about getting over the, you know, like you watch the driver, watch the goofy faces he's making. And I, and I understand I'm supposed to, you know, I, this is the first scene of the film that's supposed to reel me in. And I'm laughing and I'm rolling my eyes and I'm like, did anyone talk like that really back then in real life? <laughs> I don't know, Joe, you were there, right? <laughs> I wasn't there. <laughs> Well, I I do I do know um uh the oh shit what's her who played the woman uh fuck 
Ma- the, Majo? She, yeah, Majo. She she did bug me. She was a, Jane Darwell. She was uh she does go a little bit over the top and I know she's seriously revered, but she's got that eye thing or whatever, you know. But but Fonda's an incredible actor, You can man. tell and that, that just, he's trying to break break away from that typical shit that Max is talking about. Yeah, I, I and see. and and it's in there sometimes too with um Oh, dude, that Muley character is fucking great too, man. Uh, he's in a lot of the Ford friggin' movies too. Um, I can't, I don't know his name right now, but that scene where he's on the oh my god, it's just one of the most. He's that mouse face guy, and he's telling yeah, the story of Muley, losing yeah, his arm. And that scene with Muley there when he's uh, talking to the bank owners, and they're they're telling him he's got to get off the get off the the land is just freaking amazing when he, he kneels down and grabs the dirt you know i mean that's powerful it's powerful acting but more it's powerful subject matter you know and that that's where really the power is because when you once you start to release yourself into the film you you just accept it and you accept the film right you know and the style of the film and it's and how it's different than um you know than all this the the techniques of today it 